Like my other video on squamata, this one covers a broader topic than focusing in on a specific species. I was originally going to do a video focused on pythons, but when researching it, I realised how confusing the phylogeny of snakes is, along with the rest of squamata. I decided to make this video on their phylogeny to get these groups straight in my own head, before looking at any of the specific species here. If you do like these general overview videos, then let me know as I can definitely do more in the future, but next time I do intend to return to a more focused topic. Snakes are one of my favourite groups of animals. They are reptiles in the order Squamata. I have already done a video on the rest of Squamata, the lizards and amphibians, so check it out if you haven't already. Snakes were briefly mentioned in that video, as you cannot have a phylogeny of squamata without including them. But as you can probably guess from the existence of this video, if I had included the snakes in that video, it would have basically doubled its length. To recap a small part of that previous video, these are the main groups of squamata. The blind skinks are the most ancestral lineage of squamates, but then the phylogeny diverges into the geckos, the skinks, and the so-called true lizards. The rest of Squamata is lumped together in the last clade, known as Toxicophera. This name is slightly misleading, as not all of the animals in this clade have venom, although the only squamates known to have venom are indeed a part of it. Zooming into the phylogeny of Toxicophera, the first group is the Suborder Serpentes, or the snakes. That is probably not a surprise. You saw the title for this video, so you know what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about. Additionally, it is well known that many snakes are venomous, so it only makes sense for them to be in the clade for venomous reptiles. The remaining groups in Toxicophera are Anguimorpha, which contains the monitor lizards and their close relatives, and Iguania, which contains a diverse array of lizards. This means that iguanas and monitors are more closely related to snakes than they are to the other lizard groups, such as skinks or geckos. This is despite the common name of lizard, which is a good example of how misleading common names can be. It is for this reason that it is impossible to have a phylogeny of all lizards without including the snakes. But for now, I will stop repeating myself and actually talk about what makes the snakes unique. Like all squamates, snakes have scales and shed their skin periodically. This is actually the defining trait of the order Squamata, but what makes the snakes different from the various groups of lizards and amphibians? As pretty much anyone can tell you, snakes don't have any limbs. However, if you watched a video on other squamates, you will know that is surprisingly common among the squamates. There are amphibians, blind skinks, legless lizards, glassworms, slowworms, and many other groups of legless squamate. Snakes are not only legless, but they are also very long. Their internal organs have had to compress in size to match this body shape, resulting in oddities such as kidneys appearing one in front of the other, instead of side by side as is seen in most other animals. And most snakes only have one functional lung. To tell them apart from the other legless squamates, all snakes have no external ears and no eyelids. These features are not universal, but if the animal lacks them, it is typically a good indication that you are looking at a snake. All snakes are carnivorous, and many species have cranial kinesis. This means that their skulls have extra joints to increase its elasticity, allowing them to swallow prey much larger than themselves. They don't have the teeth seen in most animals, but instead have fangs to either inject venom or just hold their prey, and they will then use their muscles in the head and body to swallow their prey whole. Before talking about snake venom, I do want to make clear that snakes are venomous. They are not poisonous, with one or two exceptions. The main difference is how the poison is delivered to the target. Venom is offensive. It is injected into the target. In the case of snakes, they use their fangs to bite or stab the venom. Scorpions, bees, jellyfish and other venomous animals may use other mechanisms to deliver the venom, but they all use it offensively and so are venomous. In contrast, poisonous animals use poison defensively. The animal has to be attacked or bitten by another animal to affect it. This is seen in poison dart frogs, for example. The poison is secreted by their skin, so something would only be affected if they tried to attack the frog. This brings me back to my earlier point about the exceptions to snakes being venomous, as there are actually a couple of poisonous snakes. For example, Rhodophus degrinus, or the tiger keelback, can store toxins from the poisonous frogs they eat, and use this to make themselves poisonous. This is very much the exception, however, and basically every other snake with a form of poison is considered venomous and not poisonous. Not all snakes have venom, and of those that do, many are not dangerous to humans. Snake venom is modified saliva that is injected by a groove in their fangs, although some snakes have hollow fangs to make this injection of venom more efficient. 
Venom is used primarily to subdue prey, and its use in defense is only secondary. Since humans are too large to be considered prey, they will typically only be bitten if they accidentally step on or near the snake without seeing it, or if they are intentionally harassing the snake. I mention this largely to point out that popular media often demonizes snakes. They can be dangerous, certainly, but they will typically choose to flee if confronted, and will only use their venom as a last resort. As I get into the phylogeny of snakes, I should make it clear that we have poor understanding of the relationships of different snakes. This is true to some extent for all squamates, although genetic testing has certainly helped a lot, but it is especially bad with the snakes. Until recently, most snakes, not a viper or a leopard, have likely been put into the family Colubridae at some point. This became so bad that Colubridae became known as the wastebasket taxon, and if there was any uncertainty about where a snake belonged on the phylogeny, then it was almost automatically placed there. More recently, scientists have been trying to untangle the mess of this family, to ensure that Colubridae only contains closely related species. This work is still ongoing, especially because of the large number of species involved. The phylogeny used in the rest of this video is largely derived from Figueroa et al's study in 2016, who were themselves building upon previous research. This is still subject to change in the future, but for now it is the closest estimate I could find to a phylogeny for Serpentes. So, with the preamble out of the way, let's start looking at some snakes. There are two infraorders in Serpentes. The first is Scalicophidia. Scalicophidia contains the blind and thread snakes, which are considered the least related to all other snakes. To be honest, it is extremely unlikely that you have heard of any of them before, unless you regularly make a habit of researching snakes. The other infraorder is Alethinophidia, which contains around 95% of all snakes. The main feature shared by the snakes in Scalicophidia is their fossorial lifestyle as they spend their time burrowing underground. Their common name of blind snake is not completely accurate, but they do have worse vision than other snakes. Their eyes are heavily reduced and typically covered by an opaque scale. The first of the families in Scalicophidia is Anomalopetidae. Commonly known as the primitive blind snakes or the dawn snakes, there are 20 species spread across four genera. These snakes are typically small, being less than 30 centimetres or 12 inches in length, and have a noticeably blunt head and tail. Like the other families in this group, dawn snakes are fossorial and only have vestigial eyes. They are only found in Central and South America, although one species is rumoured to have been introduced to Mauritius, but this is unconfirmed. They are distinguished from other closely related families, as they have teeth on both the upper and lower jaw, as well as a different number of rows of scales. Due to their secretive nature, not much is known about their lifestyle. Most of what is believed about them is based on inferring from better known members of close related families, so it may not be entirely accurate. These facts include that they may eat eggs, larvae and pupa of ants, or that they are oviparous. The next family is Leptotiflopidae, which is more commonly known as the slender blind snakes or the thread snakes. Like the dawn snakes, most of the thread snakes are small, being less than 30 centimetres long. This is with the exception of one or two species that are noticeably larger. For example, the big scaled blind snake can reach lengths of up to 70 centimetres or 27 inches. In contrast, this group also has the smallest known snake in the world, with the Barbados thread snake being around 10 centimetres or 4 inches long. They are widespread, being found in parts of Africa, Asia and North and South Americas. They eat the adults of termites and ants, as well as their eggs and larvae. The family Duropilidae, or the Indo-Malayan blind snakes, contains around 30 species. An exact number is hard to determine due to how little is known about them. There is one genus with 29 species, but a potential second genus with one species is sometimes assigned to this family. But it is sometimes assigned to Typhlopidae, which is one of the closely related families we haven't covered yet. This entire family was only formally created in 2010 by Vidal et al. Before that, these species were all in Typhlopidae. They are found in parts of Asia, including India and Southeast Asia. The next family is Xenotyphlopidae, or the Malagasy blind snakes. As the name suggests, these are only found in Madagascar. This family has only one genus with two species. It has been suggested that these two species should actually be considered normal variation within one species. This has not been widely accepted, but could change in the future. These species are threatened by mining and logging in Madagascar. One species is listed as data deficient, but the other is considered critically endangered. 
Like with many blind snakes, little is known about them, but they are assumed to eat ants and be oviparous, like their closest relatives. I have mentioned the last family, Typhlopidae, once or twice already. Also known as the blind snakes, this is by far the largest family in Scalicophidia, with over 200 named species. They also have the largest distribution, being found on every continent except Antarctica. They only have teeth in their upper jaw and cannot dislocate their jaw like more advanced snakes. This means that their prey has to be small enough to fit into their mouths. Like their closest relatives, they eat ants and termites and are also oviparous. Returning to the overall phylogeny, let us now start looking at the infraorder Alethonophidia, which contains all remaining snakes. Analeidae is likely the first family of snakes I've mentioned that you would recognise as a snake if you saw it in the wild. There is only one species in this family, Anilia cytale, also known as the American pipe snake or the false coral snake. This name makes a lot of sense as it has the stereotypical black and red coloration seen in some true coral snakes. Unlike them, it is not venomous and will feed on a variety of amphibians and reptiles, along with some invertebrates. Similar to the snakes in Scalicophidia, it has reduced eyes. It is believed to be the snake most closely resembling the common ancestor between the snakes and their closest lizard ancestors, as the false coral snake still has a very lizard-like skull. It is found in northern South America, from Venezuela to Suriname, through to Ecuador and Brazil. It is also the first known example of oviviviparity. Oviviviparity means that the mother will have eggs but will incubate them inside of her body instead of laying them. The young will then emerge from the mother once the eggs hatch. This is a breeding strategy that is considered the middle ground between laying eggs like most reptiles or having live young like a mammal. It is a common breeding strategy in certain groups of snakes. The sister clade to Analeidae is Tropidophiidae. They are known as the dwarf boas, but this is a very misleading name, as they are not closely related to true boas. Their other common name is the thunder snakes, and there are 34 species over two genera. There used to be more considered part of this family, but several genera were found to be more closely related to the true boas, and so were moved to another family. Thunder snakes do have some unusual abilities. They have some limited colour changing capabilities, able to change colour from lighter at night to darker during the day. They can also auto-hemorrhage from their eyes, mouth and nose. Auto-hemorrhage means that they can deliberately start bleeding to try and deter predators. Thunder snakes are found from Mexico, south through Central America and into South America. While some species are found on the main continent, many of them are restricted to islands, such as Cuba, Jamaica and the Dominican Republic, among others. They eat mostly frogs and lizards, and they are not venomous, so constrict their prey, similar to the true boas. Returning to the phylogeny, all remaining snakes are in the clade Aphrophidia. From here, let's start with Europeltoidea, or the Europelted snakes. Like with most of the snakes we've talked about so far, this name probably means very little to most people. There are three families here. The first one is Europeltidae, or the shield tail snakes. This family contains 45 species of burrowing snakes only found in India and Sri Lanka. They are not venomous and have narrow pointed heads with small reduced eyes. Their common name also reveals their most distinctive feature. Their tail has heavily keeled scales, meaning that the individual scales have a ridge in the centre making them rough to the touch. The tail is also often an unusual triangular or wedge shape. Like with many of the fossorial snakes, little is known about the shield-tailed snakes. They are usually black, brown or purple, but some species have red, orange or yellow spots or bars. They are nocturnal and tend to prefer high elevations. They dig their own burrows and their unusual tail is used to plug the hole behind them. This prevents other snakes from attacking them from behind. They mostly eat earthworms and possibly other arthropods. Shield tails seem to be very docile when handled by humans and never bite. Their preferred strategy to defend themselves is to defecate, which I am sure is not pleasant for those handling them. Cylindrophidae contains the Asian pipe snakes or the Asian cylinder snakes. It only has a single genus, which contains 13 species. As you can tell from the phylogeny, these are not closely related to the American pipe snake we covered earlier. They are only found in Southeast Asia. They are burrowing snakes that are notable for having banded patterns on their belly. This is highly unusual among snakes, with most only being patterned on their back. They have a small, blunt head without a distinct neck and a short tail. Note that despite being generally long and skinny, snakes still do have a defined tail and neck that are separate from the rest of their body. 
Their coloration is also quite distinctive. In addition to the patterns on their belly, they typically have contrasting light and dark blotches. Little is known about their behaviours, but at least one species uses constriction to subdue prey. They eat elongate vertebrates such as Sicilians, eels and other snakes. The last family in Europeltoidea is Anomachilidae, or the dwarf pipe snakes. Recent studies have shown that these may be paraphyletic with the Asian pipe snakes, so this could be included in a single family with them in the future. This has not been formally proposed yet, however, so I am still including these as separate families. The dwarf pipe snakes only have one genus with three species. They are found on the Malay Peninsula and the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. Their coloration is black to purple brown with an orange red band around their tail and some pale markings on the head. They are adapted to living underground with short, blunt tails and small, rounded heads that are not distinct from their neck. They live in leaf litter in lowland and montane forests up to 1500 metres or 5000 feet above sea level. As you are probably getting tired of hearing by now, they are poorly studied, so little is really known about them. The next superfamily in Aphrophidia is Pythonoidea. As you may guess based on the name, this contains the pythons and their closest relatives. This also means that they are the first snakes we are covering that people will have commonly heard of. There are three families here, the first of which is Xenopeltidae, or the sunbeam snakes. This contains only one genus with three species. They are found in Southeast Asia and are known for their highly iridescent scales. Like many of the other snakes we have talked about, they are fossorial and rarely seen. They are not venomous and kill their prey using constriction. They are typically nocturnal, emerging at dusk to hunt for frogs, snakes and small mammals. The next family is Loxosemidae, which only contains one species, Loxosemus bicolor, the Mexican burrowing python. It is the closest relative to the true pythons. They are found along the Pacific coast of Mexico, but their range extends into Central America as far south as Costa Rica. Their coloration is usually dark with patches of white scales. Interestingly, after shedding, most pigment can disappear, resulting in a white snake with small dark patches on its head. They are semi-fossorial, making them difficult to study. The head is shovel-shaped to help with this, and the eyes are reduced. They are believed to mostly eat lizards and rodents, but will also eat invertebrates and even eggs. They are oviparous, laying clutches of two to four eggs. Finally, this is the first well-known snake family that I will cover. This is Pythonidae, or the pythons, which includes 39 species across 11 genera. They are non-venomous constrictors, and originally they were placed as a subfamily of the boas. Since the late 1990s, they have been determined to be more distantly related, leading to this current placement on the phylogeny. One major difference between pythons and boas is that pythons are oviparous, whereas the boas are ovoviviparous. Pythons can be found in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia and Australia. Burmese pythons are also a major invasive species in Florida in the United States of America. The world's longest snake is the reticulated python, which can grow to over 8 metres or 28 feet long. This means that they have a wide variety of sizes, all the way down to the pygmy python, measuring at around half a metre, or one and a half feet. Pythons are often poached from the wild for their meat and skin, leading to many species being endangered. Their skin is used to manufacture belts or handbags, and this situation is not helped as farming pythons is very expensive. They are also sometimes poached for the pet trade. Pythons are fairly common in the exotic pet trade. Many species are bred in captivity to reduce the demand for wild-caught specimens. However, due to the large size of most species, they can be dangerous to handle, and there are cases of them killing their keeper. Despite this, most species are known for being fairly docile. The issue with the larger species, like the Burmese or reticulated pythons, is that if the snake is irritable when being handled, a bite can cause serious injury despite their lack of venom. And the heavy weight is also an issue for a single person. The bull python is one of the most commonly kept snakes in captivity, and it is desirable for its various colour morphs, manageable size, and easygoing nature. The next superfamily is Boidea, or the boas and their closest relatives. The most distantly related family in this superfamily is Calabariidae. This only has a single species, the Calabar burrowing python. As this common name suggests, it used to be considered a python, but has since been moved to be more closely related to the boas. It actually used to be in the family with the true boas as well, but has since been moved to its own family. The Calabar python lives in western and central Africa. Like all boas, it is a non-venomous constrictor. It burrows through leaf litter and loose rainforest soil. It is around a metre long and is fairly docile. When confronted by a predator, it curls itself into a tight ball to protect its head. 
The tail has a white band and they can wiggle this to attract a predator and distract it from its head. It is also protected somewhat from predation as its skin is the thickest and toughest of any known snake. It is believed that this tough skin is to protect it from rodents which are their preferred prey. The next family is Sanziniidae or the Malagasy boas. This is a family of four species across two genera which are endemic to Madagascar. Like with Calabariidae, they also used to be a subfamily of the true boas but were later determined to be more distantly related. Like all boas, they are non-venomous constrictors. The species in this family are diverse in terms of habitat and behaviour. They range from semi-arid and terrestrial to tropical and arboreal to living in shrubs near waterways. They range in size, again depending on the species, from 1.5 metres or 4 feet to 3 metres or about 10 feet. The next family is Turinidae, which includes the rubber and rosy boas. This is a newly created family, and from my research online, it does not appear to be commonly used yet. As I said at the start, I am following the phylogeny set out by Figueroa et al. in 2016, and so I have included this family here. It contains four genera, with seven species between them. Many sources include these in the following family, but interestingly, two of the genera are the ones moved from the family containing the thunder snakes I mentioned earlier in this video. These snakes are found from the United States of America, South through Central America, and into Northern South America. Rubber boas are actually the most northern of all boa species, being found as far north as Montana, with very rare sightings over the Canadian border. This name is given as the snakes are a little wrinkly, and have smooth and shiny scales, giving them a strangely rubbery appearance. The rosy boas also have quite a striking appearance, with pinkish scales and blotchy markings. They will eat most small vertebrates, including rodents, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. The next family of boas is Erisidae, which contains one genus with 13 species. Older classifications will include the rosa and rubber boas here as well. Erisidae are also known as the old world sand boas. They have no distinct neck, a short tail, and a very cylindrical body. As the name suggests, these boas are found throughout the old world, Europe, Africa, and Asia. The next family is Candoeidae, which has one genus containing five species. They are commonly known as the bevel-nosed boas. Bevel is a term used in carpentry, which refers to a sloping surface. This name comes from the shape of the head, which is triangular with an upturned nose. They are found in islands in the Pacific Ocean, including Samoa, Tokelau, and New Guinea. They eat frogs and lizards and are usually nocturnal. They only breed once every two to three years, and most species give birth to ten or so young at a time. One species, however, has considerably more offspring. The Solomon Island ground boa has been shown to give birth to up to 40 at a time. Several males will pursue a single female, but they do not appear to fight during the breeding season. Finally, the last family here is Boadae, or the true boas. As you might have noticed from the other families we have covered, the relationship between boas and the other groups is still debated, with many of the other families being included here at one time or another. With the way I have done this phylogeny, the true boas contains 34 species across 5 genera. They are known as heavy-bodied non-venomous snakes that constrict their prey to subdue it. They are found in Central and South America. The most well-known species is the boa constrictor, although several of its subspecies have more recently been elevated to the status of separate species, so even it has been disputed. Another well-known boa in this family is the green anaconda, the heaviest snake in the world, and the second longest only after the reticulated python. Several of these species, including the boa constrictor and the anaconda, are common in the exotic pet trade. As was mentioned with the pythons, keepers do have to take care when interacting with them, due to their large size, even though they are typically mild-natured, at least when dealing with captive bred specimens. Boadae is the last of the boa families. So, returning to the main phylogeny, the next group is a clade-labelled Canophidia. These are commonly called the advanced snakes, but this name seems a little unfair. It is not as if the pythons and boas are particularly primitive. The first family of the advanced snakes is Xenophididae, or the spine jaw snakes. This common name comes from the spiny roof of their mouth, which is one of their distinctive features. They also have bumps on the scales on the head that can be used as a sensory organ. There is one genus with two species which are found in Malaysia and Borneo. Very little is actually known about these snakes. They are believed to be fossorial, and they definitely eat lizards, but may also eat other small vertebrates. The next family is Boliaridae, which only has a single living species, the Round Island Ground Boa. 
There was a second species, the Round Island Burrowing Borough, but there has not been a confirmed sighting of this species since 1975, and so it is believed to have gone extinct. They are endemic to Round Island, one of the offshore islands of Mauritius. They reach lengths of 1.5 metres or 5 feet, and are dark coloured on their back with pale scales on their belly, but they are known for their ability to change colour. They appear darker during the day when they remain inactive, and are paler at night. Their main prey are skinks and geckos. The next family is Acrocordidae, which has various common names including the wart snakes, file snakes, elephant trunk snakes and dog face snakes. Their skin is loose and baggy, leading to several of their common names. Their scales are heavily keeled, giving them the name of file snakes. There is one genus with three species in this family, and they are found in India, Southeast Asia and Australia. They are fully aquatic snakes, with eyes located higher on the head than are seen in most snakes. They are ambush predators, lurking on the bottom of rivers and streams to strike at prey swimming past. Their rough scales help them hold fish, despite how slippery fish can be. The next family is Xenodermidae, or the odd scaled or dragon snakes. There are 34 species spread across 6 genera, although many of these have only been formally named in 2019 or more recently, including several this year in 2023, so many sources still list fewer species. They are only found in Asia and typically prefer forests. They are opportunistic carnivores preying on other vertebrates. One particularly notable member of this family is the dragon snake, Xenodermis javanicus which has an extremely striking appearance, with ridges of keeled scales giving them a dragon-like appearance. While this appearance makes them desirable to many reptile keepers, they frequently die in captivity, so few people are willing to attempt caring for them. Despite this, a few people have managed to keep them successfully, although the exact care requirements for them is still not widely known. The remaining clade is labelled the colubriforms, as it contains the colubrids and their closest relatives. Interestingly, you may notice we have not covered any venomous snakes yet. That is about to change, as the colubriforms contain some of the deadliest animals on the planet. The first family in this group is Periidae, which has 42 species across four genera. A lot of research has gone into this family recently, with many new species having been described in the last few years. In just 2023 alone, both the Dulongjiang and tiger slug eating snakes have been described, with an additional 15 species having been described since 2015. As you might be able to guess, the reason for this is molecular analyses. These analyses have shown that single widespread species actually have multiple distinguishable populations on a genetic level, even if they look similar enough that they are difficult to tell apart in the field. So, that previous single widespread species is now known to be multiple species, each restricted to a different locality. Periidae are non-venomous snakes found throughout India and Southeast Asia. Most species specialise in feeding on snails. Their lower jaw is not symmetrical, as this lets it pry open the shells of its prey. For example, one species, a Waski snail eater, has an average of 17.5 teeth on the left side of their mouth and 25 on the right side. Most are arboreal, but one genus is notable for being unlike its close relatives in that they prefer to burrow. Moving on to the next family, we come to Viperidae, the first of the highly venomous snakes. Vipers are divided into three subfamilies, which between them have around 365 species. Many of them you will know by other names, like rattlesnakes, pit vipers, puff adders, bushmasters, moccasins and lanceheads. They are found in most places that have snakes, with the notable exception of Australia. Even Britain's only venomous snake, the common adder, is a viper. The vipers are characterised by a triangular head that is distinct from their neck. The odd shape of their head is to accommodate their large venom glands. They have unusually long fangs for a snake, which are hinged so that they can be folded pointing backwards when the mouth is closed. When the mouth is open, these fangs will then fix into a position ready to strike. These fangs are hollow, and are used to inject their venom directly into the target. Viper venom generally kills by causing a rapid loss in blood pressure. It also causes intense pain, local swelling, blood loss, and can prevent blood from clotting. This venom may take longer to act than the venom used by other snakes. So vipers have also evolved a process known as prey relocalization. Vipers deliver certain proteins along with their venom, which they can then track to find their subdued prey. Rattlesnakes, for example, are well known for striking and then letting their prey escape. This strategy has the benefit of minimising contact with potentially dangerous prey, reducing the chance of the snake being injured. I am not going to go through every group of viper, but the subfamily Crotalinae is worth focusing on briefly. Also known as the pit vipers, their common name comes from the pit they have in their loreal scales, which is one of the scales between their eye and nostril. 
This pit is used to sense heat in their environment, which they use to sense the body heat of their prey. This makes them extremely accurate when striking. All vipers in the Americas are pit vipers, although they can also be found in Europe and Asia. Members of the family Homolopsidae are commonly known as the mud snakes or the Indo-Australian water snakes. As this last name suggests, they are found in parts of Asia and Australia and are mostly aquatic. Different species specialise in different environments, with some inhabiting brackish or salty water systems such as mangroves or coastlines, while others live in fresh water. There are 29 genera of mud snakes with over 50 species between them. They are a type of snake known as rare fanged venomous. This means that they do not envenomate with their main fangs like a viper, but only with fangs further back in their mouth. This means that they need to get a much better bite to inflict venom onto their target. Most rear fang snakes have to chew on their target to envenomate, as the venom is part of their saliva and the chewing action stimulates this. Rear fanged venomous snakes are not usually as dangerous as front fang snakes. Their venom is usually milder, they inject less of it, and they need to get a better bite to inject any at all. This doesn't mean that they are harmless. They can still cause some medical complications in humans, but typically only for people with an allergy. In the case of the mud snakes, their venom is very mild and usually only causes itching. Several genera of mud snake are notable for being the only snakes known to rip their prey into pieces instead of swallowing it whole. For example, the crab-eating water snake unsurprisingly specialises in eating crabs. It will pull them through the coils of the body to rip it apart before eating it. The last two groups of colubriforms are both superfamilies. So, looking at the first one, we have Elapoidea, or the elapids and their closest relatives. The first family in Elapoidea is Prosimnidae, or the shovel snout snakes. This family has one genus with 18 species in it. They are only found in sub-Saharan Africa and are mostly fossorial or rock dwelling. They are small snakes with a distinctive small wedge-shaped head. They mostly eat eggs but will also eat insects. Their bone structure is notably different from other snakes, including less and smaller teeth and a more rigid skull with less kinesis, among others. This has made them historically very difficult to place in a phylogeny. Buhoma is a little different than the others we have looked at so far. As you can tell from the dashed line, this is one group that I could not find a good place to put them. Buhoma is a genus, unlike the families I've been looking at, but there does not seem to be any consensus on whether they should have their own family or should be placed into an existing family. Buhoma used to be included in the family Lamprophiidae, which we will be covering in a minute, but many subfamilies in that family were split from it and either formed their own families or were absorbed into other existing families. This leaves Buhoma with its uncertain placement, although it is clear that it belongs somewhere in Elapoidea. So, then, the genus Buhoma contains three species, known as the small forest snakes. They are found in Central Africa, in countries such as Rwanda, Tanzania and the Republic of the Congo. Not much else seems to be known about them. Researching this genus was quite difficult, as most sources either listed the species with little other information, or only focused on the trouble with placing this genus into a family without describing the animals at all. Even the geographic information I mentioned was only from observations on iNaturalist, as it was not listed anywhere else that I could find. From the little I did find, they seem to eat frogs, and are found in forests at fairly high elevations, up to 2200 metres or 7000 feet. They are also small, being only around 25 centimetres or 10 inches long. The next family is Simophidae, the sand snakes, which includes 57 species across 8 genera. This family covers a wide range with species throughout Africa and Asia as well as in southern Europe. They will eat lizards, frogs, rodents and birds, although the exact preferred prey will change slightly depending on the species. The snakes in this family are rare fanged venomous. Like with the other rare fang snakes we've talked about, they are typically not considered dangerous to humans. However, if they do get a good bite on a human, they can cause intense pain and swelling at the bite site. The species in this family tend to be oviparous, and so lay eggs. I use that wording because there is some evidence that species like the rhombic scarp sticker use a breeding strategy somewhere between oviparous and ovoviviparous, where they incubate their eggs inside their mother for a time, but will still lay them before they hatch. Lamprophidae, or the house snakes, is a family of snakes that currently have 90 species across 18 genera. It used to be a much larger family, but genetic analysis has separated out many of the less related species. Families we have already covered, like Prosimnidae and Samophidae, used to be included in the subfamilies here, before being given their status of full families. The genus Buhoma was also in here before being removed. Even just from the genera that do remain, it is actually very difficult to give any generalizations for the entire family. 
They all live in Africa, including nearby islands like the Seychelles, but aside from that, many are terrestrial, but some are fossorial or semi-aquatic. Some move quickly, while others are slow. They also cover a range of biomes, including deserts, grasslands, tropical forests, and mountains. They feed on a wide variety of prey, again depending on the species. This basically includes all of the commonly known groups of animals, as it could be mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, or invertebrates. Some species use constriction to subdue their prey, but there is no evidence for this for other species. They can't even agree on their teeth, as this is the only single snake family to include front fanged, rear fanged, and fangless species. At least most seem to have no venom, or at least venom that is not dangerous to humans. As you can likely tell, this diversity makes the group a taxonomic mess. It is slightly better now with the removal of less related groups, but there is still plenty of work to be done on sorting out this family. I couldn't actually find out what made the snakes included in Lamprophyidae similar enough to be included in the same family at all. The most well-known family in this superfamily is undoubtedly Elapidae, or the Elapids. This is a large group of venomous snakes found throughout the world. They include all venomous Australian snakes, the sea snakes, the coral snakes, and the cobras, among others. There are 55 genera, with around 360 total species included in this family. They are characterised by small, fixed, hollow fangs at the front of their mouth, which they use to inject their venom. This is in contrast to the other large group of venomous snakes, the vipers, which have large, hinged fangs that they can fold into their mouth. Elapids can't do this, so their teeth have to be much smaller. Another large difference from vipers is the type of venom they use. A lapid venom is neurotoxic, which paralyzes the muscles and causes death by paralyzing the diaphragm, leaving the victim unable to breathe and so they suffocate. Different species may have slightly different venom to this, however. Cobra venom often includes hemotoxins, which thickens the blood, while spitting cobras have a more cytotoxic venom, which destroys cells. A lapidae contains the snake with the most potent venom in the world, which is the inland taipan in Australia. Despite holding this record, these snakes are rarely encountered, and even if they are, then they are far more likely to flee than bite, so they are not considered especially dangerous. Large species, like mambas and cobras, are possibly more dangerous, due to the large quantity of venom they inject in a single bite, and they are also much more likely to be encountered. There are a lot of different elapids, and they are all fascinating in their own way, so I want to take some time to focus on some of the more prominent groups of them. The first one is the cobras. These are known for rearing up when being defensive and extending its hood in a threat display. This hood is actually a modified rib cage that has been flattened to be used for this purpose. The largest elapid is the king cobra, which despite its name is not a true cobra, but it is related. You may have also caught my mention of spitting cobras before. Yes, in case you didn't know, some cobras have developed the ability to spit their venom, so they can be dangerous without getting close enough to be bitten. They will aim for the eye of their target with a high level of accuracy, and the venom, if it makes contact, can permanently blind the target, as the venom destroys the cells in and around the target's eyes. Sea snakes are most closely related to the Australian elapids, but they have some modifications for their aquatic lifestyle. The only non-venomous genus of elapids is actually a sea snake, but the rest are all highly venomous. The most obvious difference in sea snakes is that the tail is flattened to provide an oar-like appendage to propel themselves through the water. Many are fully aquatic, but some, especially the sea crates, still spend much of their time on the land. Their nostrils have valves to allow them to hold their breath underwater, but they do still have to breathe air. They tend to have larger lungs than terrestrial snakes, however, to help them hold their breath for longer when diving. Unusually for reptiles, some sea snakes can actually respire through their skin. This is much more commonly seen in amphibians, as the reptile's scaly skin is usually too thick. Studies have shown that some sea snakes can get 25% of their oxygen requirements through their skin, however. They are also able to expel excess salt from their bodies by flicking their tongue, which is necessary for animals living in a marine environment. The last group of elapids I want to take a moment to focus on is the coral snakes. These are known for their bright colorations, often using some combination of red, black, yellow and orange stripes to warn others that they are dangerous. This coloration has been mimicked by snakes that are not venomous, and not closely related to elapids, to offer some protection from predators that cannot tell the difference. This has led to rhymes for people to try and tell which snakes are dangerous coral snakes and which are harmless. For example, red touch yellow killer fellow, red touch black friend of Jack, will almost always work in the southwestern United States of America. The minute you leave that small geographic area, however, following it will kill someone, as snakes in other parts of the world are coloured differently and do not follow this pattern. 
The last family in the superfamily, and the one most closely related to the Trilapids, is the spididae, or the stiletto snakes. Other common names for them include the mole vipers or the burrowing asps. As these names suggest, they are fossorial, spending most of their lives underground, but they will sometimes emerge from their burrows in the early evening, especially after rain. There are currently 70 species divided into 12 genera. They are found in Africa and the Middle East. Like their close relatives, stiletto snakes are also venomous. However, due to their smaller size, most species are less likely to kill an adult human. The venom is known to inflict severe necrosis, which kills the cells and body tissue. This means that if a finger is bitten, the person is very likely to lose the finger, even if the bite is not lethal. There is no anti-venom for this bite. Doctors can only treat the pain and then wait to see how bad the tissue damage is. Performing surgery too soon or lancing blisters does not help and in fact may make it worse. Stiletto snakes are often difficult to identify and may be mistaken for one of the similar looking harmless snakes. This is one of the reasons they are the cause of many of the snake bites in South Africa. One way to distinguish them is their behaviour. When on the surface, stiletto snakes will try to escape by digging their head into the sand, causing their body to arch just behind the head. Moving on to the final superfamily in Serpentes, we finally come to Colubroidea, or the Colubrids and their relatives. Of all the snakes we've talked about, Colubroidea likely has the biggest taxonomic issues. It used to include the vipers and the lapids, which we've already covered. Now it sometimes only has the family Colubridae, but more often, that is split into a bunch of different families. Even with this confusion, this superfamily still contains around 70% of all snake species. With that said, it only makes sense to start with Colubridae, or the Colubrids. This used to be a wastebasket taxon, as we have already mentioned, where any new snake was almost automatically just placed here if it did not obviously belong in any other family. While well, efforts have been made to rectify this more recently, it is ongoing work, so more may change with this family in the future. Even with removing many of these snakes, it is still by far the largest family of snakes. There are over 100 genera, containing around 880 species. This number increases to over 2,000 if you consider the following families part of this one as well. Colubrids are largely non-venomous, although some genera are rare fanged venomous, such as the mangrove snakes. They are found worldwide on all continents except Antarctica. It is hard to give more generalisations for this group of snakes due to the sheer number of them. Different species have different diets, behaviours and habitats. It feels a little wrong to spend so little time on such a large group, but I don't really have anything else to add, so let's move on to the other families that are sometimes considered subfamilies of Colubridae. The first of these families is Sibinophiidae, or the hinge teeth snakes. It contains two genera with 11 species between them. Oddly, the two genera are very geographically isolated from each other, with one in Central America and the other in Asia. They range in size from around 30 centimetres or 11 inches to 1 metre or 3 feet. They have very long tails which can account for around half of their total length. They are not venomous and eat mostly lizards. The next family is Natricidae, which does not have a common name but includes the garter snakes, the North American water snakes and the European grass snakes. Some of the old world species are known as keelbacks due to the strong keeling on the scales down their back. There are 36 genera with over 260 species. They are most diverse in North America, but are also found in Central America, Asia, Europe and Africa with a single species in Australia. Most species are semi-aquatic and feed on fish and amphibians, but a few are semi-fossorial or live in leaf litter and feed on invertebrates. Most species are harmless to humans, although a couple can inflict non-threatening symptoms, and two species are known to inflict life-threatening bites. This includes the tiger keelback, which was mentioned earlier as being one of the few snakes that is truly poisonous as well as venomous. The next family, Pseudoxenodontidae, is often considered one of the most poorly known groups of snakes. Considering some of the groups we have covered, that is saying a lot. They have various common names, including the bamboo snakes, foss, cobras, and mountain snakes. There are 10 species between two genera. They are found in South and Southeastern Asia, and different species will eat earthworms or amphibians and lizards. No human bites are known, so it is not known if they are venomous or not. At least two species have a threat display where they flash banded coloration, spread a hood, and they can even play dead. It is the hood that is the reason they are sometimes known as the false cobras. The last family, Dipsatidae, is a massive one, containing over 100 genera with over 800 species. They are found in the Americas and are most diverse in South America. Many eat frogs and lizards, and some will eat mammals and birds. Certain genera seem to specialise in feeding on slimy prey, which includes not only frogs but also earthworms, snails and slugs. 
Almost all species are harmless to humans, although a few species can inflict painful bites. Sometimes this family is further divided into two families to differentiate between the ones found in Central America as opposed to those found in South America. Like with Colubridae, it is hard to give more information about such a diverse family. We have now talked about all of the families in Colubroidea, and so have finished all of the snake families. I hope it is now obvious why I could not include all of this information in the first Squamata video, and I suspect that this one may be even longer by the time I am finished with it. Snakes are fascinating animals that are often unfairly demonised due to the ease with which certain species can kill humans. The truth is most snakes don't bite humans unless they are startled or feel threatened. Humans are too large to be prey for almost all species, so most snakes prefer to flee if possible. There are many different groups of snakes, and I hope this video has given you a new appreciation for many of them and their unique adaptations. Next time I do intend to do a more species focused video, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you for listening, and feel free to suggest another group of animals you want to see me cover in the comments.